Far South's understanding of the world is based on classical and biblical foundations. It's been from the beginning in her first days and continues to do so. I think in your reading you have uh, the first item in your reading is Emmy Bradford's um, essay and he talked about the classical backgrounds from the very first days and he was using Richard Beale Davis and I'm using Richard Beale Davis and other writers. I'm folding in Bradford, Davis, Lewis Simpson, all these folks who came from the 1970s, 1980s, maybe into the 1990s, and no one has seemed to do that in the last 20 years. So I'm using them, I'm standing on their shoulders and their broad shoulders to stand on, but I'm trying to uh, give context to those writers, all of whom you should read. <clears throat> So, this, this fact that classical and biblical foundations undergird our identity uh, is true despite a radically anti-traditional time and the relentless efforts of the remakers of things to create a new thing, we've held on. Uh, some of us are conscious of holding on uh, using uh, well, no, knowing that we come out of that Western tradition, uh, many of us don't know it, but feel it. It's, uh, it's, it's bred in the bone as part of our cultural inheritance. So I'll be talking about that a little bit as well. Um, <clears throat> this new thing, this Hobbesian new thing, if you want to bounce off of last night, has little to do with the classical and biblical foundations of Southern identity. And Don was the first to tell me that Hobbes uh, would not allow the classics in his republic. Did I get that right? Okay, you can, I think you'll see why once I give my talk, talks, <laughs> you can see why the classics would be anathema. And the word used by certain people, including the Puritans, the classics have to be, quote, anathematized. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Even though one of the chief platforms of so-called liberalism has been to erode Southern beliefs so that, in modern terms, red states can become blue states, the South continues to base its essential conservatism on classical and Christian views. Some of us are conscious of this, I'm more conscious of it now than ever, having done this study. Um, an even greater number of us are probably not conscious of it, or perhaps only vaguely and instinctively so. <clears throat> Still, Southern identity and the character of her people are largely shaped accordingly. It's this understanding of the world and not Southern politics that has been responsible for the solid South. A brief history of diverging sectional attitudes to the Greek and Roman classics is illuminating. Here, I base this consideration on my new volume, <clears throat> The Classical Origins of Southern Literature. <clears throat> As to the central place of literature in understanding Southern identity, I quote Flannery O'Connor. In 1960, she declared, in the long run, a people is not known by statements or statistics but by the stories it tells. Literature is a great register. It may be the best register. So I'm so glad that Don always honors literature as the means of entering our understanding of the South. <clears throat> we Southerners have been fortunate to have a brilliant Southern liter literary tradition now recognized worldwide. It has now taken its place among the great literatures in the Western tradition. Grace King, one of the South's great, albeit unfairly neglected, writers, wrote in 1903, I have always thought that a nice study could be made out of the ideals in fiction and poetry represented by North and South. This is 1903. She was right on. Look at Northern literature, look at Southern literature. They are registers for their people. Um, Ideals and identity go hand in hand. 
I know the subject of our conference is identity. So uh, I think maybe my talk will be pertinent to what Don had wanted us to consider. I've reshaped uh, a good bit of classical origins to use the term identity, uh, doing what Don asked me to do. So I think, uh, I think um, after this week, after hearing all these talks, we will be able to come up with some, at least some definition or some understanding of what we are and who we are more consciously so. Okay, so Grace King, she was intensely interested in preserving Southerners' sense of themselves. Her definings of Southern identity are among the best in her day. Her stories and her splendid memoirs are essential documents in any discussion of Southern identity. She has not been that popular because she was not, although a woman writer, she was not what we call a feminist writer. In fact, she called the feminist the shrieking sisterhood. <laughs> that did not <laughs> endear her, <laughs> endear her to uh, see all these other women writers have been discovered, pe people like Kate Chopin and so forth, but not Grace King. So she waits as a treat for you. She's the real deal. Okay. <laughs> And that's all I'm going to say about Grace King, and I did not include her in the classical origins. There was just too much. I started to do a chapter, but Marie would have killed me. No, <laughs> she's straggling me back there. <laughs> all right. Three centuries before Miss King, that's where we start here. Three centuries before Grace King, we must consider the beginnings of Southern identity. For that purpose, I am going to summarize uh, some of the some from the first pages of the book. The book. Okay. <coughs> shuffling, shuffling. <coughs> Influenced by the lead of Richard Beale Davis's intellectual life in Jefferson's Virginia, well, that's, that's definitely a must for you. Intellectual life in Jefferson's Virginia. Italian historian who used that book, uh, his name Romando Luraghi, it's L-U-R-A-G-H-I, considered the contrasting, quote, ideological bases for sectional cultures in the South and in Puritan New England. And this, uh, this was in his The Rise and Fall of the Plantation South, which he published in 1978 four years after Richard Beale Davis published his intellectual life in Jefferson's Virginia. Here, Luragi found that the two civilizations, his words, the two civilizations, had so different and distant fathers as Sir Walter Raleigh with his Renaissance classical ideal and John Calvin with his extreme anti-classicism. Luragi declared that Quote, suspicion and scorn of classicism permeated English Puritanism from its very beginnings, inasmuch as the hated established high church was as prone as Roman Catholicism to Roman tradition and is ready to swallow the bait of classical culture, unquote. Luraghi found that the ideological underpinnings of New England were thus profoundly anti-classical, and classicism and its studio humanitatis had to be anathematized. There's that word again. Luragi <clears throat> concluded that Virginia, on the other hand, had been, quote, generated as the legitimate daughter of English Renaissance culture. Virginians read their Bibles, quote, from the standpoint of Baldassare Castiglione's Il Cortegiano, which is the book of the courtier. Okay. Luraghi further concluded that both classical culture and ethics, which had been present at the very birth of Virginia, did not cross the ocean on pilgrim ships. In fact, Luraghi declared, quote, the Renaissance had to wait for two centuries more before entering New England, and only then as a, quote, late coming stepdaughter of the great era in peculiar garb, similar to old puritanical intolerance, but disguised in a classical robe. Luragi felt that there is certainly deep meaning in the Puritan rejection of absolutistic seigneurial England 
as well as in the sense of continuity with the philosophy of the mother country that was felt by the Virginians. I like a little book by Timothy Jacobson, which you've probably never seen. Um, it was kind of a coffee table sort of book on the South. But Timothy J Jacobson phrased it nicely when he found Virginia and Carolina to be thoroughly earthly effort to transplant the institutions and the general style of living of old England. He continued that the Puritans were fleeing old world vices, but the Virginians hoped to celebrate and fulfill the old world's virtues an old world with which most of them had no serious religious, ideological, or philosophical complaints. In recognition of the continuation of the main currents of the South's traditional European ties, Luragi student and d disciple Valeria Lerda, and I had the uh, pleasure of meeting her for, and talking with her many days at the University of Georgia. She edited a book called The United States South, Regionalism and Identity, published in Rome in 1991. This is a hard to find book, but you need to get it if you can. Now with the internet, you might be able to snag it somehow on amazon.com or someplace, um, ABE books or whatever. <clears throat> the volume was comprised of the proceedings of the European Interdisciplinary Symposium of the Southern Studies Forum in Genoa, Genova, Italy. This was in 1990. So the volume is a compilation of essays. I've never seen anybody use it in, in our circles, quote it or use it. So that's one to find. It only came out in a paperback that was very, um, I think, almost quickly done. But I have a copy she gave me, that's why I have it. <laughs> I don't think I'd know about it otherwise. She was a visiting scholar at the University of Georgia about 1995, I think. She stayed a whole semester. So uh, we need to look that book up. It's got some major, major essays. Uh, the lead essay was by Luragi, <laughs> her mentor, a very pro a very provocative essay entitled, The United States South, Region or Nation. Now this is the last, not the last thing he did. See, So you'll find it in that text. Valeria Lerda, L-E-R-D-A, if you're trying to spell it. <clears throat> in 1978, the same year that Luragi published his work on the Plantation South, Richard Beale Davis demonstrated in his three-volume Intellectual Life in the Colonial South, 1585-1763, the particulars of how from the first settlement, the South had a culture markedly different from that of New England. This three-volume set is close to 2,000 pages. It's a monumental volume which is not mentioned enough. Uh, Davis expanded upon what he found to be persistent early aspects of the Southern mind as distinct from the New England and Northern. These were, now this goes toward identity again. Aspects of the Southern mind as distinct from the New England mind. These were a joy in the gifts of life, a dislike of and even a horror at ideology, and most especially of the fanatical variety, a penchant for historical precedent and veneration of the past, you know, the classical veneration, pietas, which we translate as piety, badly <laughs> translate, a flexibility and tolerance in the approach to personalities, questions, views, and issues, in other words, tolerance. Professor Davis found that these Southern traits function together in harmony to yield a composed and unified mindset, more or less at peace with itself. At peace with itself. 
Jacobson, Jacobson's word for it in that <laughs> coffee table book, I like better, satisfied. At peace with itself, satisfied. Ten years after Davis and Laragi, Lewis Simpson, one of the preeminent literary historians of the late 20th century, considered men like George Tickner, Thomas Jefferson, Captain John Smith, and other early figures as representatives of their regions. In other words, he's looking at the difference as well. Um, he's very good. Everybody should look up Lewis Simpson and um, has a lot of books. I'll give you a few titles. Um, Simpson concluded that the seeds of distinctiveness north and south were present even in the earliest days of American colonization. Uh, this is from his book, Mind and the American Civil War, which he published in 1989. And I see some heads nodding. You know it. Good. He inquired into the intellectual, philosophical, and literary differences of the regions. This work was a succinct recapitulation of a lifetime of scholarship that had seen the publication of three earlier distinguished works. And this is a major figure we're talking about, Lewis Simpson's The Man of Letters in New England and the South, another contrasting of the two, The Dispossessed Garden, which is my favorite, and The Brazen Face of History. So you've got four Lewis Simpson books, and I've read them, and I've tried to incorporate these ideas in creating the context for you. In, in the early days of, in the early pages of, of um, the classical origins of Southern literature. <clears throat> a minor emphasis of Davis's volume was the observation that early Southern writing stands at the head of a continuum, I like that, that could still be seen in the authors of his own day, that is, 1978. So now that's been 40 years ago. Um, and what I've tried to do in three or four hundred pages is to talk about post-1978 a lot. So we're not going to do that this, this week. Uh, I'm going to ask you to get the book from Don, and you'll be able to follow us. It's just too much. I mean, to, to explore this topic uh, would require a lot more than two hours. So, but you will, I hope, have the book pretty soon, and you'll be able to carry what I say in these two hours forward. I'll do some talking a little bit about Cormac McCarthy, one of my favorite writers. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Faulkner. Um, but current writers like Larry Brown of Oxford, Mississippi, excellent writer, one that you may never have heard of. But um, I'm not going to do, <laughs> not going to talk about them. Uh, very much, but um, I do want to say that Davis's volume about the continuities as of 1978 with my own study will be carried forward another 40 years. Still there, still there, in an amazing way. Uh, so Davis saw modern Southern literature of the 20th century to be an expansion rather than a repudiation of what came before. My study of that literature finds me in agreement. A literary historian and philosopher Emmy Bradford also agreed in his essay, That Other Country, Romanitas in Southern Literature, which was first published in Modern Age in 1980. I'm so glad you had that chapter by Emmy Bradford to be able to add to this mix. <clears throat> Davis called for the study of the subjects and styles that connected colonial Southern literature with the writing of the 19th and 20th centuries. This present work elaborates upon Davis's brief look at classicism in early colonial poetry. He didn't do very much with it, <clears throat> to the degree that I can say if one has to sum up the origins of Southern literature in one word, that word might be classicism specifically the Greek and Latin literary classics. Much classical literature was particularly congenial to the Southern sensibility because it promoted agrarian culture and rural life as the summit of earthly contentment, 
again, satisfaction. <laughs> nature will do that. You know nature has two faces, but the face that uh, stabilizes and um, makes life um, enjoyable is uh, the one that Virgil writes about. And he also writes about the other side as well. So, um, <clears throat> the summit of earthly contentment, rural life. In Charleston, if you got wealthy as a merchant, God forbid, your ideal was to have a plantation and you leave money handling, money dealing, the cash nexus society. And you get a house on East Bay Street, you know, fine, that's okay, but your life really revolves around the plantation. So nobody has ever uh, wanted, as a planter, to become a merchant. That's preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> that's the classical ideal, <laughs> then, rural life. So, particular classical writers might fit particular southern situations at particular times. You've got this wonderful, I hate to use the word smorgasbord, but you do, you can, you can dine on this or dine on it. Every facet of your life can be covered. If you're a good southerner, every facet of your life can be covered. And then, and then you have the, the added uh, Christian tradition, which is certainly not averse to the classical one. And then you got the solid South. We've got good underpinnings. And you know, I've always said, don't worry too much. Uh, worry enough, but don't worry too much about what's happened to the South, because we've got good foundations. What does the other have? Hobbes? <laughs> you know about Hobbes now. Thank you, Don. <laughs> I mean, don't build your civilization on sand, shifting sand, or whatever else we could use as an image. I always use agricultural images, <laughs> but um, I'm fine with that red clay, which I farm. <laughs> it's a lot solider, you know? But uh, anyway, <laughs> I'll quit elaborating. Um, the Southerner could find at least one ancient to be a comforting pertinent model and guide in the manner of a sage father or grandfather to a responsive and impressionable child. But you see, that image doesn't work with the other. They can't be children. They have to be fathers, right, to tell other people <laughs> what to do. But we sense ourselves as children. And we have fathers, we have ancient fathers, wh whom we venerate with pietas in the good Roman way. Veneration. It becomes a key word in our understanding of our own identity. Veneration, veneration, veneration. And we'll be saying a lot about that maybe in the second hour. But now, I'll tell you what I do after I sort of give you that preamble. I then go on to make use of the studies of the colonial era libraries in North and South. And there have been some piecemeal studies of libraries in the South and libraries in the North. What actually um, were in, what books were in colonial libraries? And you use inventories of estates to find out because books were so treasured that the items are often enumerated, you know, it'll be Virgil's the Aeneid, Virgil's the Georgics, Horace is, yeah. In other words, we know what were in the libraries because of those good inventories made for estates. And so there have been scholars other than myself who've done it, so guess what? I just use them. I'm, I trust them, and so I was able to compile uh, the scholarship of about 50 years, which we'll talk about what's in those libraries. All right, so <clears throat> the, 
The striking differences between Virginia Carolina collections and those of New England underlines the thesis that the South venerated the classics, whereas New England, more often than not, excluded them. Now, it's not that they didn't have any, it's just we're talking about periodicity, numbers, statistics. As we will see, the classical writers that Southern libraries favored, they all praised rural life and character rural life and character over urban life and a business mentality. So, <clears throat> one has only to look at the colonial libraries from Maryland to South Carolina in order to find that they contained a large complement of Greek and Latin literature. And give you an example, a study of the colonial libraries of South Carolina, good many studies done, I think they must have inventoried books more in this state than they did in other places. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but uh, these inventories enumerated from 1679 to the year 1776, and I just want to, you know, use that. They yielded figures that established the classics and bellatristic literature. Bellatristic literature means fiction, poetry, okay. As by far the dominant categories, there were things like dictionaries and law books, but um, not in the same quantity. Theological works were present, but relatively scarce. In the classics, Homer tied with Virgil. Homer tied with Virgil. There you are, two writers. The classical Virgilian Georgic would have been particularly suited to expressing the conditions of the colonial South, for Virgil was the ancient who most artfully celebrated colonial settlement and the fashioning of estates. Next came Horace. The Horatian odes, epodes, epistles provided models of settled rural estates with lives of polish, civility, hospitality, enjoyment, there's that word again, contentment, there's that word again, uh, all major facets of Southern uh, identity, the Southern ideals and identity. So these words that keep cropping up, you know, you finally factor them in. For his relevance to the colonial southern mindset, one need only read these lines from Horace's Epodes. Happy is he who far from business, like the first race of man, can till inherited lands with his teams, free from all payments of interest, he who avoids the market and the proud thresholds of mighty citizens. <laughs> is that pertinent today? <laughs> I think it is. And I think the key words here are inherited lands. Think about that. What does inherited lands require? Passing it down through pietas, piety to your people before you, and their piety to you is to pass it down unbroken. That word inherited lands, isn't that key? And I'm not giving you the Latin, but it, that's translated about right. It has more meaning in the Latin, <laughs> but inherited lands. Okay, in that we see the Southern understanding that you stay put. You can't pass down inherited lands if you go from California to New Mexico, to Canada, to South Carolina, to Virginia, you can't. So we're a restless bunch, we are. We're trying to get away from something, it seems like to me. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the responsibility of passing down inherited lands to brats who really don't want it. <laughs> there are two sides to that, you know. So for pietas to work, it has to be both ways. And we don't have that. We've got the torn fabric now. So these are serious considerations, which I didn't really want to bring up right now. But <laughs> it had to be said. I love that. You know, happy is he who far from business, like the first race of man, can till inherited lands with his teams, free from all payments of interest, he who avoids the market and the proud thresholds of mighty citizens. 
Horace was followed in the colonial libraries of South Carolina by Ovid, then Seneca, Caesar's commentaries, Cicero, such a key figure uh, as, as we're going to talk about. Why Cicero? Not because he's eloquent, although that's important. Uh, juvenile, that could surprise some. Uh, Aesop's fables, it was very popular, Aesop's fables during that span. Um, Terence, great. Attesting to the appreciation of Ovid in the South was Virginia poet Richard Rich, his carefully polished translation of Metamorphosis for his London friends. Rich was among the very first of verse writers in the New World. His competent poem, News from Virginia, was published in London in 1610, a full decade before Plymouth. And we've got to get our time level our time chart going here, 10 years before Plymouth. The presence of Cicero, we need to say a little about him, in the colonial southern libraries was appropriate. It was he who declared that the city creates luxury, the source of avarice and all crimes, whereas country life teaches thrift, you better believe it, carefulness and justice. Okay. The rural villa, in contrast to Rome, was for Cicero a dominion of the independent mind. And if you're wanting to read about that aspect, go to the Tusculan Disputations. Cicero's Tusculan Disputations. You, you really need to read it. And if you don't have the language original, get a fairly decent translation if you can find They're out there. Virgil had mated the rural life with the literary life. Both Virgil and Cicero had a mighty influence upon Jefferson in forming his independent republic of letters at Monticello. Even into the 20th century, a writer like agrarian uh, Alan Tate in his novel The Fathers named his composite agrarian hero, Cicero Cincinnatus. <laughs> he really knew his classics. Alan Tate may have been, in his day, the most um, versed in the classics. We'll talk a little bit about him, maybe in a second talk. In these colonial Carolina libraries, belletristic literature was well represented with Milton, Jonathan Swift, and Shakespeare who counted fewer than Virgil and Homer, but not too much fewer, right? Then came Pope, Samuel Butler's Hudibras, love that. If you know Samuel Butler's Hudibras, you know it's a hudibrastic satire of Puritans. And here it is, <laughs> that's a popular book. I bet it's not a popular book in New England, <laughs> but the libraries had Samuel Butler's Hudibras. Um, then it's Fenelon's novel, Adventures of Telemachus, which I've not read, so I don't really know what to say to that. Henry Fielding, I have read. Now, that's surprising, isn't it, to find Henry Fielding's novels, Tom Jones and Joseph Andrews, popular in South Carolina libraries. You've got to read Tom Jones to see why I would say that's kind of, <laughs> well, that's kind of, um, surprising in a way. Um, also Joseph Addison there, Don Quixote is there, Lesage's novel Guy Blas, Tobias Smollett's novel Roderick Random, and you probably don't even know that book. Uh, I hadn't read it until I started studying this. Uh, oh my, that's key. Roderick Random, the plays of Moliere, then James Thompson, who's a Scots poet, uh, the, the author of The Season, celebrating the cycle of the year, wonderful romantic, early romantic, um, or pre-romantic. Uh, Matthew Pryor's poems, Samuel Richardson's popular novel Clarissa, which was sort of at the bottom of the list. They liked Tom Jones better than Samuel Richardson's Clarissa. You can see why. You read the two. Okay, you, that's a register of culture too. Tom Jones, you've got to read it to know what I mean. Uh, <clears throat> Tom Jones, 
good many. Clarissa, there were only five copies. But the fact that there were copies at all is very interesting. Bellatristic literature was represented in the libraries of the South. Satires and earthy realism, such as the novels of Fielding, were telling inclusions. Now I want to say a little bit about Smollett. His date, 1721 to 1771, especially in his novels Humphrey Clinker and Roderick Random, Smollett has been considered by his biographer the last major voice defending an ancient tradition, that tradition being the natural legislator as the man of the land whose birth, wealth, and intellect had elevated him to independence. Oh, the landed man who is the ideal again. Southerners like that. That's what they were aiming for. This was in keeping with the Greeks and Romans, for whom generally, quote, the model of civil polity became agrarian, paternal, and hierarchical. So Smollett saw the rising commercial interests in England to be responsible for the evils of the age. The English Parliament by the 16th century had been attempting to preserve the sanctity of the country estate. You've seen Downton Abbey. <laughs> London plundered the rest of England as England plundered Scotland and Ireland. Smollett found life in Scotland a better way of living because it was an older way of living where the people have, quote, kept fast the best of ancient traditions, remaining hardy and virile, and living with more kindness, hospitality, and rational entertainments. This is Smollett. Wow, yeah, Smollett was in South Carolina libraries, but not Daniel Defoe. Now, do all you know, you don't know Daniel Defoe probably, but if, if the two, some of you do, if, if the two writers are possible to teach in uh, an American or, well, in, in, a, in a literature class, Smollett and Defoe, it's always Defoe. And now we know why. Let me tell you about Defoe. He praised tradesmen and manufacturers. Smollett regarded the land and its resources as the ultimate economic sources of a society. Smollett rejected merchants and their morality of profit. Quote, <laughs> men of landed substance and not, quote, mere moneyed men, mere moneyed men. For Smollett's gentlemen, wealth gained through commerce and the cash nexus undermines grace, hospitality, and fine manners into vulgarity and prostitutional values. Sikora, the biographer of Smollett, found Smollett's works to have provided the most sustained attack of the period on commercial values. That's key. The appearance of his volumes rather than Defoe's in the colonial libraries of Carolina is thus again likely highly significant as a cultural register and an understanding of who Southerners are. So it's obvious that Southerners identified with Smollett rather than Defoe. Um, I think a book could be written on that. <laughs> I'm looking at Marie, she said, please, no, <laughs> one at a time. But a book on Smollett and Smollett's um, popularity in the South, wouldn't that be really good? Uh, that'd be a good subject for a seminar or even a whole week at the Abbeville Institute. <laughs> We'd all have to read Smollett. And what a pleasure. I mean, I really enjoyed R Roderick Random. I didn't read, I haven't read Humphrey Clinker, but with a name like Humphrey Clinker, you know it's gotta be good. <laughs> Humphrey Clinker. <laughs> How many of you have read Roderick Random? Ah, Bill Wilson. 
No, I'm so glad. Uh, at least one person here. Anybody, um, has anybody read Humphrey Clinker? You have? Oh, my, several. Oh, yeah, The Sims Man. Yes, good. How many of you have read Defoe? Look, see? There it is, isn't it? What a register. And you're the good people. <laughs> but you have bad teachers. <laughs> no, uh, I didn't know either. I was just as ignorant as the rest. Uh, before I started working on this study, well, we learn. Books, as in the formation of the Charleston Library Society, which happened in 1748, folks, and important. You, you'll probably walk by it uh, if you're on Meeting Street. Um, the Charleston Library Society is one of the venerable institutions in America. Um, and they kept records of what they ordered. <laughs> and uh, an Oxford Don has just written a book using those records, and I can't remember the name right off. Marie, would you like me to add that to the? Yeah. No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I just found the book. And uh, what he does is look at the records of orders from London booksellers. Wow. And let me tell you, same thing we're saying. In other words, it corroborates what we're saying from these other sources. So you finally, you really can pile on if you want to with all these sources from all these different uh, venues and so that you know then that you're on solid ground when you do this. So um, books themselves became a sign of colonial Carolina's plantation wealth and refinement. They were read. They weren't just put on the shelf to look pretty. Recent studies by Shelley Smith have found that in the 15 years before the revolution, this is quote, Charleston imported more books than any other American city with a population smaller. 61 booksellers in England did business in Charleston. 61. And uh, this study by the Oxford Don said, and it kept them going. In other words, they had to rely on Charleston and other colonial buyers to keep their book companies going. Well, that's, a, that's wonderful. So 61 booksellers did business in Charleston. Number one in the category in America was Philadelphia with a population much larger and more wealth. But uh, that's pretty amazing. Boston and New York did not measure up in either category, even though, like Philadelphia, their populations were much larger than Charleston's. Another register that goes along with what Don was saying last night. So as cultural historian Barbara Bellows has written, by 1774, Charlestown had blossomed into the belle of British North America Nine of the ten of the wealthiest men in the British colonies lived in Charleston's adjacent plantation districts. That underscores nine of the ten in colonial America. The source of that wealth was agriculture, as they were well aware. These wealthiest men were all planters, not city men, although they, although they would probably have a townhouse. But the wealth didn't come from the city. Um, Smollett had said that the land and its resources should be the ultimate economic sources of a society. The land and its resources. And in the South, look, a wonderful climate, a wonderful soil. So how blessed. They understood, too. These men how un understood how blessed they were to have such a congenial climate. Thank God who placed us here beneath so kind a sky. That's Timrod, it's quotation. It's not always kind, but <laughs> Hurricane Hugo would kind of say, oh. But you know what he meant, absolutely, a congenial climate. Uh, therefore, wealth in the manner of Smollett and not Defoe had provided the means to purchase these books. 
and the planter, encouraged and guided by the classical model that held his lifestyle in highest esteem, provided the ideal and the identity. He set the society's conservative and traditionalist tone, manner, belief, political form, and fashion. He also dictated its literary taste. As we will see in our second talk, <clears throat> in the southern world, the goal of the successful merchant was to become a planter. The, hell, the, the, the libraries held by these men and women were gauges of their worldview. You can tell a person by the books that person has on his shelf and reads, not just for show. Okay. Robert Heilman, now some of you know Robert Heilman through Shakespeare studies perhaps, the most distinguished Shakespearean of his day, and that would mean the 1930s, 40s, into the 50s. This is what he said. The agrarian concepts that come from the classics are the key underpinning of the essays two centuries later than these colonial times in I'll Take My Stand, 1930. And he's absolutely right. So we're, we're looking ahead to 1930 and we're seeing that continuum that we, we'll, we'll, we'll just hold for. Uh, so I'm going to break off here, and I'll just continue in my sec second lecture.